Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Let's start with um, your kind of career at Price Waterhouse and kind of what you did there and kind of how that set the foundation for um, your career. Sure. Yeah, I, I did the uh, five-year master's in accounting program at UT, and that typically leads to a job with one of the big accounting firms. Yeah. And uh, and so I ended up with Price Waterhouse Coopers. I was fortunate enough to get put on the uh, Exxon account, which was kind of the flagship account for the firm. And then their headquarters being in Dallas, you get to deal with a lot of, I guess, the C-suite people. And, and so you just learned a lot about what goes on and discussions between audit partners and you know upper management of a public company and then <clears throat> it was less of you know talking to the cash management accountant at Exxon and more of like you know the roll up of all these entities all over the world um and so i guess the perspective it gave me is that there's a lot of room for error like materiality something had to be off by like 50 million dollars to to matter um but you you know you get to talk to this these management teams and you see that there's a lot of give and take and and so then when i entered i guess kind of the securities world it gave me perspective about what all goes into conference call um and transcripts what all goes into sec filings those those discussions that are happening between the accounting firms and the management teams. And it, I guess, made me believe that there's, you know, a lot that can be gleaned from actually reading the filings, which most investors don't do. And then kind of knowing like if a auditor resigns, um, there's probably a reason or, you know, <laughs> if, if there's a restatement, like there must be some pretty bad stuff going on to, for the auditors to actually force those sort of things. When something's, when like $50 million is missing, where is it? That's a good question. Um, I mean, for them, I guess that was almost like a rounding error, just given how big they were, especially after merging with mobile. But, yep. you know, yeah, it could be in one entity and not in another, or, you know, they ended up having to write off some investment in a, West African country that, you know, was a bad deal. Um, but I, I didn't have any instances where I had to find where $50 million went, but yeah. that was just kind of the, the threshold for like, you know, we're going to fight for a change in this disclosure or whatever, if, if something's off by that, that much. Whereas I had other clients where it was like, if $50,000 is, is missing, that's material material. Okay, I'm going to try and figure out how to frame this question. Um, these, like, if you think of Exxon, it is so big, and they can distill it down to a PL and a balance sheet. But clearly, like, it's so big that to get anything done with speed, if everybody had to understand every little detail of the business financially to make a decision on whether to loan to them or not, it would take forever. So is it, just, is it kind of fair to say that a lot of people just trust public companies for the numbers they put out and then that's backed by Price Waterhouse or the auditor? Yeah, that would be accurate. Okay. And I guess also in a lot of these big companies, maybe maybe the banker in some foreign countries dealing with uh, like a joint venture or in a smaller entity that then rolls up okay. to the bigger things. So, and you know, maybe they're not actually dealing with the CEO of Exxon, they're dealing with the VP of, you know, upstream in West Africa or something. Right. Are, um, in your um, experience with talking with upper management at some of these public companies, I would imagine it's like totally different than talking with upper management at a private company. It seems to me when I at least watch things on TV or listen, um, they're coached kind of more on what to say in public arenas. Can you kind of talk more to like what those discussions are like and how they might differ from the everyday business? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I guess they would typically hold stuff closer to the vest given yeah. like reg FD disclosure issues where they can't tell me something that they haven't already <clears throat> told everyone else. Oh. Whereas a private company CEO doesn't really, um, you know, care what 
what he's told someone else versus me. Um, and so he's got his lawyers to answer to, you know, uh, other investors, the SEC, things like that. But I mean, just what we've found over time is that they're going to say a lot of bullish things and they're not going to really address the bearish things. I mean, we all innately do that. We want to present what's good and and kind of hide hide what's bad. And <clears throat> and so we've just found like reading lots of conference call transcripts, you know, listening to lots of management presentations, um, people can make numbers, kind of tell whatever story they want to, and then say what they want to about about those numbers. And yeah. Unless unless someone else is doing the work to really dig into that, it's hard to tell them they're wrong. All right, we, we, we can't let the listeners not hear the story of you uncovering Enron before the Western <clears throat> world uncovered Enron. So let's talk about it. Sure, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't wanna take uh, credit for totally uncovering it, but our, the investment firm that I was working for had a long position in Enron. Uh, we weren't doing any shorts, it was long, long only, but given my accounting background, there had been a couple instances where they had asked me to look at things and like there was a European company that was having rev revenue recognition issues. So we, you know, I suggested we get out of it. You know, we didn't make money by shorting it, but you saved 30% by avoiding the blow up. Um, and I actually had quite a few friends that worked at Enron and in talking to them, like I could never get an understanding of what they were doing you know they were trading weather futures or just stuff that seemed so far out there and when you try to ask them like how do you make money doing that or how's enron getting so big like it just didn't really seem to add up and it kind of made me think about a there was an old saturday night live uh commercial about this it was they were called like the change bank or something and they're like you bring us in a dollar we'll give you 10 dimes you know you bring us in a quarter we'll give you five nickels like they weren't really making any money they were just <laughs> shifting things around um and so <clears throat> i guess when then when i looked into the financials there was just so much shifting around between all these spe special purpose entities and it was hard to follow the money and there was no real indication that the operations of the business were supporting all that. So when discussions with people, the numbers, the disclosures, all that didn't add up, it was just kind of hard to say, yes, we should still own this and tell investors why we owned it. So we exited. Um, and then it, I don't know, it was maybe like six months later where, you know, comes out with all the, the really bad really bad press and all the accounting problems and things like that and crumbled. I'm not asking you to call anybody out here, but when, when that's going on, do the employees even know that something's not adding up or they're just like, this is my job. I show up eight to five, I do it. And somebody at the top knows it's the right thing to do. This is just what I'm told to do. Yeah. I think it's more of the latter. Like, yeah. you know, some guy that's out in the oil field, you know, handling some of their upstream oil and gas operations has no earthly idea what the CFO is doing with creating all these special purpose entities and yep. holding stuff off balance sheet and things like that. He's just doing his job, checking logs, you know, things like that. Well, we'll probably get back to this um, in how you can glean from like lower level folks in the organization that it's not adding up. Like I would expect you didn't talk to the CFO, but you were able to gather from enough conversations at other parts of the company to go, it's not adding up. Yeah. Um, and kind of to that point, like we actually had a company in, uh, it was a Canadian uh, dissolving pulp company. And when cotton skyrocketed like 10 or 15 years ago, all the apparel manufacturers started going to, <clears throat> to rayon because it was cheaper material. Um, than cotton and this dissolving pulp company in canada they had moth you know taken the mothballs off a, a plant and started operations again and um and the ceo is just putting out these 
really bullish assumptions about what their plant could do, all these contracts that they had locked in with Chinese customers. Um, and this guy had never run a public company before. He had been like worked at some Canadian bank, so he had never run like a manufacturing type of business. Mm -hmm. So I uh, started looking up, you know, other plants and found a plant that uh, a private equity firm in California had bought. And my buddy happened to work there, so I contact my buddy. I'm like, can I talk to the guy at this plant? And so puts me in contact with the plant manager kind of the CEO of that plant. And I'm like, what can you tell me about these assumptions that this guy's making about where he can get EBITDA margins and that he has Chinese customers locked in and at these sort of rates. And now the spot rate is below those rates. And he's like, yeah, I mean, that's a pipe dream to get to those margins. And the Chinese customers that I deal with renegotiate contracts every day. They're not gonna pay me above spot rate. So then that just, gave us a lot of confidence that what this CEO of this public company was saying was not true and to say that that was a good short opportunity. I think the most interesting about the public stock markets or the, the public stocks is, it's kind of what you said, like most people won't read an 8K or talk to people. It's like we treat private companies like, yeah, to learn about a private company, you need to learn a lot about a private company. But as soon as it goes public, it's just a ticker symbol and all these kind of fundamental core business um, practices are kind of just thrown out the way, which obviously creates a ton of opportunity because um, everything you're saying is so basic, but it seems to get lost somewhere in the shuffle. Do you know why that is? Why, why do humans or people somehow don't correlate that a public company is also a company just like a private one? I mean, I guess the purpose of having a public company and it being regulated and you know, by state securities boards and SEC and, and things like that is so that people can trust it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just, I guess, enough bad actors out there that it's good to have some healthy skepticism, not to be like a perma bear and everyone's lying and everything's a fraud, right. but um, just have some healthy skepticism. That's a good way to put it. Let's um, Let's transition. So uh, you start your career there and then let's just kind of talk about what you're doing now and kind of how that all got started and how you kind of started leading yourself to build a career in pretty much shorting stocks. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess it was back to that accounting background and I guess helping avoid some blowups on long ideas that made me start to gravitate towards trying to find opportunities where you could actually profit from from those blowups. Um, and so I ended up going to work for a, a family office in Dallas that had uh, seeded a, a long short fund inside of it. And so I guess uh, I got to start using that, that background, that knowledge in that manner. And then we were actually looking for additional help on the short side. It was just 1 p.m. and, and me, two, two guys in, a, <clears throat> in an office managing money and uh we found this group that was putting out like short ideas their short idea generation service and it was mostly like accounting based you know day sales outstanding or stretching like is the company aggressively recognizing revenue or um, extending more favorable credit terms or, or things like that and, and so got to know those guys and uh and there became an opportunity to join their team and they were launching a fund at the same time. So I guess my role was dual in nature and that I was writing short ideas that other hedge funds around the country were subscribing to, but then we were also managing a small amount of capital um, kind of to track those ideas or, or kind of put our money behind where our mouth was. Um, and there came a point in time where those businesses needed to be split. Um, both from like a perceived or actual conflict of interest. Yeah. And, and then an LP in the fund just wanted the founders of the business to concentrate all their time on managing the capital rather than trying to operate this other business. Yeah. And so I'd been writing half the, the research and so I spun out with the research business, became a small business owner. And so for 
it's a little more than 10 years. I've been building that short research business where you're basically providing a flow of short ideas to hedge funds. And you know, it used to be very accounting focused. We've kind of, I guess, changed and become more fundamental focused so that while the accounting stuff can matter, like what really matters to us is if there is there a change in the competitive landscape, if there a disruptive product or technology, is there something that's going to shock a cost structure that's not appreciated by the market? Is there a supply side short, like capacities way outstripping demand and that puts downward pressure on pricing and they typically have levered balance sheets to accompany that. And, and so <clears throat> we've been able to thankfully build a client base like around the world, um, you know, Europe, Asia, US, people that are interested in seeing seeing those ideas. And so it's, I guess in some ways, it's more rewarding to be right on a short than a long because you're typically contrarian in that viewpoint. Whereas if you're right on a long, yeah, a lot of people are right on it. The short, you know, there probably weren't too many people on your side and a lot of people against you, but it's also pretty hard, especially in years when the market's up a lot. And so you're fighting that kind of momentum regardless of what the fundamentals might be for the short thesis so just before we take a step further you write research for shorting stocks that hedge funds buy correct and by definition shorting a stock is betting that it will go down that the value of the company is not what it's supposed to is not what it's perceived at at the current moment correct okay so just a more a little bit more just on how the business works but then i just want to talk about the whole landscape um so you write these reports and do people subscribe to buy these? Like how does a hedge, how do, do hedge funds consistently get all your ideas or do they just buy one offs? Like how do you, how does your business model work? How do hedge funds buy ideas? Sure. So it, it is a subscription sort of business model. And so basically they're taking whatever we're putting out. It's not like they ask us to work on a certain idea. Um, and the only time that someone doesn't take everything is if they have like a sector focus or a geographic focus and so yeah. so we do uh, us and european consumer technology media telecom and industrial companies okay. so let's say there's some fun that's a global consumer company or glo focused on global consumer and they probably don't care about our industrial or tech ideas so they wouldn't pay for or receive those or if they're only focused on Europe, they would only receive our European shorts and not our not our US shorts. Everyone receives the ideas at the same time. It's typically about a 50 page slide deck on here are kind of the basics and the drivers of the business. Here's the bull case that we're up against. And then most of the report on the reasons to be short and valuation, things like that. How many ideas are you coming up with a year and what, how do you determine what an idea should be versus the market's just really hot and everything's about to go down? Like in theory, you could have shorted a lot of things maybe back in January and been right on almost everything. So how do you decipher between the two? Sure. Yeah. So we'll, our goal is to do about 15 new US shorts a year and about 10 new European shorts a year. And okay. I mean, really quantity does not matter to most of our subscribers i mean yeah they might be upset if we only came out with one short or something but you know they would rather have five amazing short ideas than you know a couple of good ones and 10 mediocre ones or something like that um so quantity isn't really the game but that's just when we're discussing with a prospect that's just kind of kind of the cadence we try and give them is it's a little more than one us and a little less than one european name a month and across a team of four uh, investment professionals, that's you know very doable. Um, and to your point about you know market ripping up or down, like every time the market sells off, my friends are like, "You've got to be so happy." <laughs> and I'm I'm actually like I'm not. I mean, my retirement accounts are going down just like yours, and we actually don't think it's that good for our business because. When everything's falling, like how do we differentiate right. ourselves? And um, hedge funds, 
they're hedged, but they're not totally short. And a lot of them haven't done a good job of hedging. Um, and so, I mean, they lose money and their, you know, returns are down and then their investors start pulling capital. Like then that's an uphill battle for us because they start to cut costs and hopefully, hopefully you've done a good job with your shorts and you're not one of the services that's getting cut, but we'd rather it be like a flat to slightly up sort of market where, you know, the market's not ripping in your face and pushing up all stocks. And so it's really stock selection matters and fundamentals matter. And that I get, I feel like that's where we do the best. So you put out fifth, let's just focus on like domestic because most listeners are all domestic. So you put out 15 a year, but I would imagine you can start with like a pool of a hundred and you're like, these are all good. Um, how do you kind of figure out which ones you're going to focus on? And then I want to get the question out before I forget it, but are you betting that companies are, um, like frauds and that you're betting that it's headed to zero or are you just betting that, Hey, this company's worth a dollar. I think it's worth 50 cents and at 50 cents, then I'd probably be long at 50 cents or is it both? Yeah. So real quick, I'll answer the fraud part. So we're not really into frauds or accusing management teams of, you know, being aggressive yeah. accounting manipulators. Wizards. Um, that can be a bonus if we feel like the accounting is supporting our thesis. Yeah. Um, it's typically more that I think we're all typically have a bullish bias. Like if, if you're in a business, like, like you're in real estate, you think real estate's a good investment, that there's tailwinds to that. So um, <clears throat> you might overlook some item that could cause, um, I guess, some headwinds in maybe one sector of real estate or in a specific real estate investment or something like that. And so that's what we're, I guess, trying to identify our, um, one phrase we have for it is like a gap between perception and reality. So here's the perception by the management team and investors and other Wall Street, um, analysts like the Goldman's and B of A's and things like that, that, that they think this company can grow revenues and improve margins kind of into perpetuity. But, you know, if let, let's say like there's a grocer in Europe that we've done some work on recently, uh, it's in a single European country. It's not very big. And there's been multiple new entrants into that market that are opening like 50 to 100 stores which is a lot in a country this size and so just there's going to be headwinds to foot traffic there's going to be pressure on like there's going to be extra promotional activity trying to drive traffic so there's going to be pressure on asps and profit margins so those sort of things have just been underappreciated by the management team and other investors and so now they've been losing market share like every quarter for a year. So even during the pandemic, when things were typically good for grocers, because people were eating at home, like they were losing market share in that, in that sort of environment. And so if we can find those instances where we think the reality is different enough from a perception out there, and then pair that with, I guess, uh, valuation multiples that would allow for compression, we feel like getting operational disappointment. So then the numbers or the guidance are disappointing going forward. And then where the multiple can contract over time, that, that the two of those forces working together give you the opportunity for good downside on a short. And so it doesn't mean that it has to be trading at 50 times EBITDA. Like it doesn't have to be expensive on an absolute basis. It could be this business is historically traded at six times EBITDA and now it's trading at eight times EBITDA or it's traded at 15 times earnings and now it's trading at 20 times earnings. And so when earnings disappoint and then investors decide, I don't want to pay that much more, you know, a multiple on top of those earnings that are now maybe contracting instead of growing, I guess that's where the opportunity 
exists. Um, when you so if, if we just said this European company, does do the companies when you publish your research, how long does it take for the CEO of the said company to know that that research has been published? I th I think one of the good things about us not being fraud type alarmists um, and, and we don't use like social media or traditional media to further our, I guess, our investment case is that we can still call a management team or an you know, investor relations person at a company and get answers to, to questions and the alarm bells not go off. Um, yeah. There have been instances where we have had investor, like long investors in a short we've called or who have gotten the report from a buddy or, or something or a management team that have called. And, um, you know, I can think of one where the management team called, they're like, you're accusing us of accounting irregularities. And we're like, well, you either don't have the report or you have it, but haven't read it. Cause that's not what we're saying. We've, we laid out facts from financial statements and, and things like that. And he was real controversial. And so we got off the phone and then two weeks later they report earnings that are horrible and guidance that's really bad. And the stock's down 20%. So we feel like when the management team calls, that's usually a good indicator that maybe you're on onto something. Yeah. Otherwise they don't really need to be defending themselves because the numbers will prove us wrong. If, if we are wrong, they could just sit there. But does that take like 24 hours for them to know your research has been published or weeks or months or do this? Sometimes they never know. Yeah. Sometimes they never know. Um, like I said, since we're not yeah. posting our stuff on Twitter or yeah. anything like that. And, um, you know, I think because how different shorts are from longs, I think a lot of our subscribers keep the ideas to themselves because when things become popular shorts, it costs more to borrow that stock and it gets harder to find shares to borrow. So if, if you go share it with all your friends at, that are at other hedge funds, you know, it kind of hurts you by doing that. And, uh, and, and then, you know, if they're long, maybe they share it with a management team, but I feel like that can take weeks. And then since we're not really saying things about people, like you're a fraud or you're, you know, doing irregular accounting, like there's nothing really that they can I guess be that upset about with it just be like Goldman saying we think this is a sell for these reasons like I can't really do anything to them except maybe not include them on the next investment banking deal for a new round of debt but since we don't have any investment banking interests I guess we're not really worried about not being on the next IPO or the next debt deal yeah and that I guess that's the whole benefit of the independent research space is not having that conflict since all the money comes in investment banking and not in research at those big banks the investment banking arm i guess wields a lot of weight and i probably should ask this at the beginning um but for for a refresh how does the short actually work? You just talked about borrowing shares and some people can't get them. And so, so how does, how does it work? And, um, kind of what are the dynamics that make for a successful short as far as the actual, um, you know, fundamentals of executing the trade? Sure. So when you, when you own a stock, like let's say it's trading at a hundred dollars, you go buy 10 shares. And so, you know, thousand dollars worth of stock and, and you're hoping that that stock price goes up, you know, maybe in five years it's at 200. And so you've made a hundred dollars a share. So you've made a thousand dollars, you know, and you invested a thousand dollars. We're saying that, you know, we think that there's some amount of downside to that hundred dollars. <throat> and so we're telling people to short it, which means instead of going and buying the hundred dollar the hundred dollar share stock they would go borrow that from someone that owns it and they would immediately sell it for a hundred dollars and then when it falls to 50 or 
whatever, then they turn around and buy it and repay those shares to the person that they got it. They borrowed them from. So you have to find the so one people have to um, be willing to loan their stock out. So you'll find some stocks where um, like the owners aren't willing to loan their stock out. You, you can make you can make money loaning your stock out. Um, and so that can make it hard to to do a short or if there's too many people already shorting it and there's just not enough stock available to borrow um, that it can either make it hard to get a share at all or it can make it really expensive i mean there's sometimes really popular shorts it can cost like a hundred percent to uh to borrow them so that's an annual rate so if in those sort of instances you have to be right really quickly on the short yeah so if, if you're right in a quarter and you've only paid 25 percent and it falls 50 percent, you've still made money money but like i don't know if you followed any of the meme stock stuff We're, let's let's go into it <laughs> about Boom, a year ago the door. i mean there was the short squeeze yeah there was gamestop you know over a hundred percent of the stock was short and uh over a hundred percent over a hundred how do you get over a hundred percent yeah i guess people that were doing uh somehow were able to do what they called a naked short where you don't actually like haven't actually borrowed <laughs> the stock um and then some of it i think can be through options and and things like that and so it, all it takes is a lot of buying or like a really good announcement that it scares all those shorts um into wanting to they call it covering their short <clears throat> and so then they become incremental buyers because they're having to buy to re to return their shares that they had borrowed to someone and it just causes the stock like to tick up higher with almost every single single trade um and it's called a short squeeze i mean it, it happens with game stock type things but it can also happen with things that have much less short interest you get you know they report a blowout quarter and really strong guidance and you could have 15 percent short interest but still all those guys have got to go buy the stock and it's just painful do you think that what we witnessed in kind of 2020 2021 is a new phenomenon that people should take seriously or was this a bunch of you know robin hood traders locked in their house for a couple of years with nothing to do and no sports to gamble on and it's a thing of the past like that's kind of scary what was the company that, that made the headline and lost all the big hedge fund that got just crushed um yeah i think it was melvin King. melvin yeah do you have an opinion one way or the other? Are meme stocks and kind of this angry short squeeze that happens now on Reddit something that people should factor in or will laugh at 2020 and say, you know, what a time to be alive? I mean, I think it caught a lot of people by surprise how much um, weight or momentum in a stock that a bunch of retail investors can create. Can create because, you know, the, Prior to that, the comments were always, oh, well, it's just the it's just the machines or it's just the big banks that are controlling the direction of of these stocks. And so for you know a bunch of guys to organize on the internet and <clears throat> all see the op I mean, they had to see that opportunity that there was excessive short interest and you know, create that. I guess short squeeze and that's publicly available information you can see how short the market is on a certain thing yes yeah um and so i mean there's uh when i worked at a hedge fund i mean one thing we would do is we would look for long ideas we would often look at high short interest names that we felt like the fundamentals were trending in a good direction and so you could you know be right on like improving operations for this company. And then you could also get that short of short squeeze opportunity. And I, I know there's groups that, you know, do that at all the sort of major mutual fund companies of the world and probably a lot of the hedge funds. And so that, so when you, earlier you asked, like, how do we narrow our investment universe for shorts? One thing is like short interest 
and another term related to short interest is days to cover. Like if you need to cover your short, how many days is it going to take you to do that? You don't want to be stuck having to buy in a squeeze for two weeks or something. But how, I don't mean to interrupt. How do you know how many days? Because isn't the downside to a short almost infinite and the upside to a stock is whatever the upside is, but at the if it's falling, I'm sorry. Yeah, at an opposite. Yeah. Yeah, so for a short, your loss can be theoretically infinite. And yeah. the most, the, the biggest gain you could have is 100% if it went to zero. Yeah. Um, so that's that's why shorts are so dangerous. Like, I mean, GameStop, it doesn't make any sense that it's a however many billions of dollars company. Um, like the fundamentals do not support the valuation, but there's just other things driving the stock right now. And it's <clears throat> created, you know, losses for people way in excess of 100%. Whereas if you were, if you were long something and it went to zero, you, you can only lose 100%. Um, and, and so how do you calculate days to cover? So it's, it's typically like the amount of short amount of shares that are short. Right. And then the amount of shares that are like traded on an average daily basis. Okay. So just dividing those and think so if everyone has to cover you know and the trading volume is typically this it's going to take this long for all those people to get out of that so we're sensitive to both of those we like both of them to be below 10 our average is around five percent short interest and five days to cover and so you don't find us in <clears throat> a lot of the battleground we call them battleground shorts like a GameStop or a Tesla or or things like that. Um, we'd rather find things that other people aren't aren't talking about, and that I guess where we can add value to a fund because it's not a short that they've heard about, and not something they can read in the Wall Street Journal as in some list of the top ten most shorted companies or something. Yeah. Um, so short interest days to cover are important. Then I guess uh, market cap is and liquidity are important to us. So. We typically don't do anything below a billion dollar market cap and anything that doesn't trade at least $10 million a day are kind of our average is like in the five to 6 billion market cap range and trading like $40 million a day. So I guess the thought is we're getting ideas in front of hedge fund managers that they can actually go get a borrow, that they can actually trade in and out of. Um, and are like meaningful companies. A lot of the, a lot of the small caps, you might have some bigger buyout risk and and things like that. What happens if everybody that you send your research to takes you up on your idea? Yeah, I mean, I guess that could be a problem if they all try and do it at the exact same time. Yeah. Um, you don't see us influencing stock prices the day we publish. I feel like our investors or our clients um they're not getting paid those sort of fees to just put on what someone else says. says so they go do their own additional due diligence have calls with expert network networks management teams whatever and and then decide whether or not it's something for them there there are a number of independent research guys out there that i guess are a little more um calling for those frauds or um, maybe have a bigger following than we do where you know you can see them issue a report and before the market opens you can see that stock's trading down 10 percent or something and so in one way it's kind of cool that they have that sort of influence but in another way like their clients haven't even been able to put on the trade really they didn't have time to read the report put on the trade and you've already maybe lost a lot of the investment opportunity. All right, let's go. Let's go back into GameStop for a bit and kind of. You said the, the uh, the magic word Tesla. Um, you don't even have to answer it, but I would assume that the stock valuation of Tesla is backed up by all the fundamentals. Sure. <laughs> okay. Fair. We'll leave it there. <laughs> um, but we do live in a world now um, where one, like we just talked about GameStop, people can congregate on Reddit or whatever forum and kind of, you know, really build momentum. Then you kind of look at Tesla, which isn't um, 
it's it's a little different. It's a cult. I mean, if you believe in Elon Musk, there's people that believe in him before they believe in their family. Um, is that new, if historically speaking, or is the internet kind of brought in and ushered um, this kind of cult like mentality where you kind of have to throw fundamentals out of the water? Or are you a believer that like eventually we all kind of the truth, you can't hide the truth forever? I mean, <clears throat> there always seems to be someone that's willing to pay a higher price for something than you are. So it's, I guess, shorting on valuation is very difficult. Valuation alone. Yeah. If you have poor fundamentals or something like that, just to also support your thesis, then it can sometimes make sense. But I mean, excessively valued companies have been around forever. Um, I suspect they'll always be around because there's always someone telling a story about what this is going to be doing in revenue in five or 10 years. And, you know, they may be right and people are willing to invest based on that theory. And so, you know, maybe it has no revenue now. And so it looks crazy expensive. You know, maybe they have a billion dollars in revenue in five years. And so then it's only at five times revenue or whatever the the number is that's more reasonable on kind of that future valuation. But usually to get from zero revenues to a billion revenue, I mean, most companies have trouble guiding for the next quarter. So for them to be accurate and guiding where something's going to be in five years, there's usually not a lot of accuracy yeah. in that. Not, I'm not saying it's intentional. It's just, I mean, you run a business, you, you do probably projections for next year or whatever and and stuff comes up that changes changes that how often um from your experience does a company that you've put out as a short eventually become something that if you had a different hat you'd say all right i'm long i'm long this now or is it usually this like slow decay that in the companies that you're finding sure so that I guess there can be, we'd call them like, I don't know, bad companies or like secular decliners. Like there's just not a lot going for this company in the future. I mean, we're, we're not short or we weren't short this, but like a blockbuster, you could just see like the writing on the wall, you know, streaming, all this sort of stuff, you know, and they're still in DVDs and CDs and things like that. Like there's a lot of secular headwinds for someone like that. There's other businesses where, um, you know, like there's a lot of tailwinds to the industry they're in, but maybe there's competition coming um, or, you know, they're not going to grow as quickly as people think they are. And that doesn't make it a bad business. It may just make it like mispriced or, um, the estimates off and so that creates an opportunity but it like i said it doesn't mean that they're a bad business or going out of right. business um, a lot of people think short sellers are un-american or <clears throat> you know hate companies or things like that and it's it, it's not that at all it's just where you see i guess opportunities for that that gap between perception and reality that I talked about earlier is pretty wide. And then the multiples on top of that create opportunities. So would you say you're a pessimist or an optimist? Uh, maybe I lean a little bit more towards pessimism, but I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm not a perma bear or, yeah. you know, you just... constantly a pessimist. It's just maybe some of that healthy skepticism that I touched on. Yeah earlier um so i definitely don't think all management teams are lying or cooking the books um okay um let's talk about spacs sure what's this let's like set the stage what is a spac they've been around for a long time but i think the way the world knows them today is kind of this funny money stuff you've been pretty vocal about opinions about spacs and how they work and um, there's a guy up in uh, Silicon Valley named Chamath that's just getting his lunch eaten right now with all of his SPACs. But let's just start with what's a SPAC. 
Sure. Uh, so, I mean, it stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Corp. And it is a way for a, like a management team to raise money with, without already having a business behind that and then go take that money they've raised through an IPO and kind of do like a reverse merger by a company that already exists and is probably private. And so it's a way for that company to go public. Um, and so typically how, like, how it works is, um, you know, this company launches an IPO, you as an investor want to share. And so you typically pay $10 and you get one share of stock and then you get some amount of warrants. Um, and so one of the things that's an indicator to us, um, about, about these SPACs is like how much in warrants are they having to use to get people to participate in this deal? So, you know, if it's a fifth of a warrant, like they're not having to entice people very much, but if they're having to give a full warrant, you know, that's an indication that they had some trouble. Why? Because basically if you're getting two shares of stock for the price of one. Mm. And, uh, and so it just leads to a much higher share count. You know, it's diluted to earnings going, going forward as those warrants get turned into stock and, and things like that. And, and so, so it's called a unit and it's usually one share of stock and one share of, or some portion of a warrant. Then not too long after the IPO, those separate and are separately traded on a stock index. And so you could sell your stock and keep your warrant or sell your warrant and keep your stock or keep both or, or do none of it. But all this money that they've raised sits in a trust. The management team cannot spend that on cars or trips or uh, even like operations of the business. So they've got to come up with money out of their pocket to pay for directors and officers insurance, which has gotten really expensive with SPACs, lawyer fees, things like that. Um, and then they go shopping, like they're going to look and try and find a business that they want to own or help get public. Um, <clears throat> and there was, yeah, you know, like you said, these have been around for a long time. Um, you know, I, I remember when I was working in, at the family office, um, you know, in like the early mid two thousands, like we were hearing about SPACs back then. It's just the the number of them that has, I guess, caught all the attention, and then kind of the high profile nature of of some of the businesses that they've bought or whatever. So we had we had our existing clients of our short research come to us in the fourth quarter of of two thousand. Uh, 2020 saying are y'all doing anything in SPACs like this this is like drinking from a fire hose there's so many of these coming so we decided to invest time and um and money into building a, a database so that we could track all this um and so we have basically every SPAC that's gone public since the beginning of 2019 in there and we have like 80 data field data fields on each SPAC. Um, and so our clients can use that to go look up one they might be thinking about investing in or shorting or whatever. And then we make some recommendations of our own. But, um, you know, back to that kind of timeline or how the SPAC works. So they, they go shopping. There comes a point in time where they find something, they announce, you know. Real quick. Sure. So at this point in time, there's been a group of investors or a management team that's gone out to the market and said, hey, we don't know what we're going to buy yet, but it's probably going to be something like this. You can put in a dollar and get two dollars or get two shares and they raise all that money and then they're off on the hunt. Correct. And okay. Back to what you were saying. Yeah. So, yeah, they find a, a business that wants to be acquired and they want to acquire. And so they'll make an announcement like, you know, we're going to acquire this and um, they will um, 
put out a presentation about the terms of the deal and then typically um, like some guidance around that business. And that's where a lot of the, I'll call it funny business has happened in SPACs. So there's uh, called a safe, I think it's a safe harbor um, provision where like the SEC was not regulating what they were saying revenues could be in 2030 because it's like not actually a public company. It's not going through an IPO process. Um, and so there's just a lot of bullishness, like over bullishness in those, in the guidance that these management teams were providing about the companies that they were, they were buying. And, um, so anyway, investors then would get excited about the stock. The stock might trade more than $10. Now that there's actually a business behind it that you could value, the warrants might, you know, differ in value. And then there becomes a date where there's, you know, they're approaching the closing of the deal and the investors it originally gave them money for the shares and warrants get to vote on the deal, like whether or not they want to be in it. Um, so you can actually turn, turn your stock back in for $10. So if let's say no one liked the deal and instead of trading at $10, it went to $8. You could still turn in your shares and get $10 back. And so you didn't see many SPACs trading, trading down because there's this kind of floor in it. You've seen a lot of hedge funds use it as an arbitrage oppor opportunity and any stock that starts trading below $10 and hasn't closed the deal yet, like they'll buy it because then they, they know that they can turn it in for $10 and they can leverage that up. And even if they're only making a 50 cents or okay, wait, let's talk about that real quick. Sure. How do you, if it's already trading at eight, who's buying it for 10 back? Uh, so the money's sitting in trust. Oh, that's um, right. And so the, the guys that did the IPO, like if you want to turn in your stock, they have to let you and give you your, your $10 back. Um, is, is there a correlation between SPACs becoming popular and COVID? Or just so happened to like happen at the same time? I think just happened at the same time. I think you've like answered this, but I'll just ask it in the most elementary way possible. Why do all these SPAC buyers overvalue the hell out of these companies and do these terrible deals? Like the majority of the deals have just been atrocious because I have to imagine the early people in had some, it's like it's almost rigged for the first people in and everybody else holds a bag. Yeah. So I mean, and it's not illegal. It's just maybe unethical. Yeah. Most of these, they call them sponsors, the people that raise the money to go buy a company. I mean, most of them, their cost basis is like a dollar, two dollars. They're getting like 20% of the shares outstanding for basically free. So if the stock trades at eight, they don't really care. They've still made seven bucks a share. I mean, obviously they would rather it trade at 20, but just because something trades below trust value doesn't mean that the sponsor's losing money. And then the target company has, you know, gotten cash from this, the sponsor or this trust, and they've gotten to go public. Um, so I guess it's kind of a good opportunity for those, both of those parties. If it ends up being a bad deal, it's the people like you and me or hedge fund that invested in the deal that, um, you know, end up, I guess, losing, losing money on it. Okay. So we now kind of know what, how SPACs work. You've been really vocal about them. Now we're in 2022, like continue on what, what is your kind of thesis on all of this? Sure. So I get, I guess maybe some things we've seen happening. So one last year, maybe like in the third quarter, you started seeing uh, redemption ratios really rise. And that's uh, when I talked about someone could turn their stock back in for $10. That, that's redeeming your, your stock. And 
And when I talk about rise, like maybe historically they were at like 30% and you're seeing the average go to like 60 and in many of the SPACs we were looking at like 90% of the stock was being redeemed. So what that creates is, um, you know, let's say you raise $200 million in an IPO to buy this company and 90% of the people redeem, you now only have what, twenty thousand dollars i mean twenty million dollars to buy this company and so that company the target that you're trying to buy has to say okay let's still do the deal but now we're getting like no cash all debt or yeah all debt or let's just put a higher valuation on it to offset for the less the loss of, of cash um or the deal gets pulled and those sponsors do not want the deal to get pulled because they've invested money and like DNO insurance and lawyers' fees and all this time that um, they paid for. Yeah. And so it's kind of like get a deal done I no know. matter what. And so they'll go raise other capital, um, maybe a pipe or what's a, a pipe? Uh, private investment in, in a public company. And so it's um, just. I guess it's not necessarily an IPO, but they might go to other investors and say, do you want in on this deal? And so it's, you know, they could sell another million shares at $10 or a different price or, or something like that. Um, maybe give them some different sweeteners than they had given the original investors or something like that. And so you just ends up being more dilutive and more dilutive and more dilutive. <clears throat> and so, um, they just typically end up being a bad um, investment. Uh, an example, uh, I don't know if you remember the company Redbox. Like, do you remember those red kind of vending machines out in front of a 7-Eleven where you could go rent a DVD for a night for a buck or whatever? So that company actually like still exists. Um, and they did, like someone did a SPAC. They're actually at like every CVS still. Yeah. Okay, fair um, enough. So. You know, people think it's under the SPAC sponsors think maybe this is an undervalued company because it got hit during COVID. People, you know, were just streaming stuff at home, not going to 7 Eleven to rent something. And so maybe there's an opportunity to revitalize that business and show a lot of growth. Um, and then Redbox announced they were also getting into ad supported video on demand. So I don't know if you or your kids have ever watched um, something on Prime Video or Netflix or something where you don't have to pay to rent it, it's, but you have to watch ads you know, every so often. So that's what they were gonna get into. And so they were gonna raise 200 million. I think they got 50 million in a, in a pipe also. And they were, so this was gonna be growth capital um, to buy content for the video on demand business, um, as well as pay down a lot of debt that they had incurred. Um, and like almost 90% of the people redeemed. Um, so they ended up having to go get what was called a cash backstop. So they had to find other investors willing to put up cash because the red box was requiring a certain amount of cash to close the deal. Um, and they weren't going to have it because so much stock had been redeemed. And so I think they ended up, you know, with 80 million or something, even after this cash backstop had been raised. And so can't pay down as much debt as you want. Don't have the capital to go invest in content to grow this, you know, video on demand business. And so then that impacts like future growth. And then also there's, a lot of competition in that. So it wasn't like ad supported video and demand was not being done by anyone else. So there were those sort of like fundamental or secular headwinds to the business. And so something like that was really interesting. To okay. Us. But when are you able to short it? Because the transaction has to happen before you can actually short it. Right. So is your thesis like if this gets announced at 8 a.m. on whatever day at 8.01 a.m.? Like yeah. how, how do you, how can you execute your trade or, or your research to your clients? That, that's a good question. So 
we typically wait until um, it, it despacks. So despacks means the the deal has been announced and the deal is closed. And so okay. now it's trading as red box instead of some you know acquisition corp, some SPAC name. Um, and so it's it's now like a regular stock. You know, it probably has a ticker that you could recognize related to the business. Our box. Yeah, exactly. Is that uh, it? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, and, uh, or RDBX or something. I can't remember what it was. But, um, and so at that point, typically liquidity improves because um, there's not always a lot of daily dollar volume in the SPACs until after this um, DSPAC occurs. And then the other thing that's really important is when the lockup expirations happen. So tip, there's typically three groups that are locked up. So a pipe investor, um, they are locked up until the SEC approves the registration filing related to their pipe investment. That's typically only like 30 or 60 days. So that typically happens pretty quickly. But the sponsors that typically own about 20 or get like 20% of um, uh, the deal and then the other investor or the target, like the company they bought, Redbox in this instance, are typically locked up for, you see 180 days is kind of the, the average, but some of them can be a year and some of them can have, uh, I guess, lots of stipulations. Like if the stock trades above $12 for 20 of 30 trading days, 90 days after the deal closes, it can unlock early. So anyway, we spend a lot of time tracking those lockup expirations because that would not only create more stock for people to short, but also if your investors that kind of did the deal start unloading stock, you know, it creates downward pressure. So um, does that does that make sense? All right, I'm going to ask. I I think like the answer has been very clear. And if you've been one of the folks in some of these specs, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to call it what it is. Like to to raise 200 million for an idea, it's not like you're going. You know, are these is this retail money or is this Wall Street money? Like it, everything I've learned. I mean, today, but everything I've heard is like it seems like the system is being gamed. But there's large dollars showing up to this. Who is this money? Is it? hedge funds is it like who's putting that 200 million to work or is that one twenty dollar bill at a time from every idiot in america that thinks that Redbox is the next thing there's definitely a retail component but then there's also a large amount of hedge funds using it as an arbitrage okay opportunity so they can get that stock they can get that warrant or portion thereof and um they know that they can turn it back in for ten dollars, so it's kind of like all upside, no downside. Yeah. Um, and so I don't, I don't know who the typical buyer is after the hedge fund. Like if, if they turn around and sell their stock, you know, after the IPO and keep the warrant. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't know who that that buyer is, but um, and then it it also it's not you. It's not me. <laughs> that's for sure. Um. And it also, one thing we've also paid attention to is the, the quality of the underwriters. And I think that could also determine who the investors are. So um, there's a professor, I think, uh, maybe at the University of Florida that's looked back at like all IPOs for the last 50 years or whatever and kind of ranked the quality of the underwriters. So if it's, if like Goldman and City take this back public, that typically means a little bit more than if, if it's some like third, fourth tier sort of investment bank that you've never heard of. I, yeah. I won't, I won't name names. I don't want to yeah. call someone a bad investment bank or something like that. But. Yeah. So like what's going to happen to SPACs? Are we learning from them and they will become credible things in the future or is it going to take a long time for the SPAC uh, acronym to 
fade into the abyss or maybe we call it something different sure um i mean i you've definitely seen i'd say over the past two to three months spacs get hammered um like r.i.p chamath yeah i mean <laughs> we've i think we we did like 10 single stock kind of spac recommendations last year i think on average they're down like over 40 percent like that's crazy as a short seller to to have that sort of return on ideas but i'm not saying we necessarily did a good job because the whole group got smashed smashed and and historically like if you go back 20 years and look at SPACs like like 80 percent of them end up trading below that ten dollar level like and they just drift and drift and drift and there's i mean there's so many of them right now trading in like the two to five dollar range the problem is there's a huge number of them that are still shopping for a deal and there's new ipos happening like every month and I, th I think in uh so we just did like an update to our clients yesterday. So in the first half of February, there were, I think, 12 or 13 new IPOs. Um, I looked at the list of um, SPACs that are have not de spacked and become a normal company. And there's over 700 of them right now. Represents almost $200 billion in IPO money. And that doesn't include any pipes that have been raised associated with that. And then you typically go buy a company for like, I don't know, three to five times kind of that trust money. So you could be talking about five times 200 billion in cap, like in market cap of, of companies that are going to be bought or need to be bought. So there's, it's not like this is ending now, despite the fact that a lot of these have gotten hammered because these, the incentives are for these sponsors to make a deal happen <clears throat> or they're going to lose some money themselves. So you have seen some deals pulled. You have seen the number of IPOs slow. So there's, there's definitely been a speed bump for the SPAC world, but there's just so many that still need to make their way through the system. Yeah. And you have all this money, a lot of them shopping for the same deals. So we think it leads to inflated valuations because there's so much capital chasing these chasing these deals. Is there an is there a um is there a benefit to the the sponsors for the valuation of the business they're buying to be higher is there a benefit to the sponsor like i'm not going to name names we're invested in a couple of companies that have like a private valuation of 200 million but they've been approached by some spac folks that'll buy them at a billion and there is no competition for this business as far as i'm concerned it makes me think is the reason why they're offering a billion because they know that'll get a deal done? Or is somebody at the original founding fathers making more money the higher the valuation is that they buy? Similar to in real estate, if you're if you if you um if you make well one percent acquisition fee when you buy something, well, you make more the more you actually pay for it. Is that the case here? I mean, the the SPAC only has so much money and trust right and so that's they can only hand over so much cash yeah it just depends on how much of the target they're buying so um you know if that 200 million only buys 20 percent of the business then yeah then the valuation's a billion but if if it buys you know 40 percent then that inflects the you know, impacts the valuation and and so there's definitely a reason to inflate valuations and then there's definitely companies 
competing to buy the same company that you know leads to inflation on its own just yeah. just everyone wants the deal even if it's not an amazing deal just so that they can get their spack done and get to the lockup expiration and cash out their shares and all right one more question sure and i i, I know these are elementary but why would you want to raise a SPAC than just go buy the company privately? What is the benefit to all this? There's funny money. I mean, it's uh, I guess it's a pretty fairly easy process. Easier than just buying it privately. I don't know about that, but obviously the target gets a higher valuation. Yeah, and you have a, I guess, an exit strategy because it's a public company and you can dump your shares as soon as the lockup expiration uh a is quicker gone. yeah and then i guess why why a spac versus like a traditional ipo and i think it's just the more lax sec regulation and oversight like with some of those safe harbor estimates that i was talking about and so that's that's one thing that could really change um SPAC universe if, if the SEC were to crack down on, um, I guess, those estimates that management teams are throwing out. Okay. Um, all right. Kind of on, on shorts just in general. Um, you know, people are willing to believe a lie for a long time, and then you finally meet your maker at some point. From your perspective on the things that you're putting ideas out on, but this isn't a this isn't even to promote your business. It's a maybe just a um, industry wide understanding. When you put these ideas out, what what is the consent? Uh, how do I ask this? How many times are you um, like you have to be willing to be look wrong, even though you're right? Meaning you're right. The stock keeps going up. Everything you're saying is correct, but that doesn't matter because it's just people trading paper. So the question really becomes like, from your perspective, a successful short from the time that you maybe release an idea starts within a year, a month, a quarter, a decade, like how long do you have to be right? Yeah, I don't know that there's a certain time frame, but okay. I do feel like, um, I mean, our average holding period is about a year. Um, okay. So I feel like we either get voted right or wrong. Yep. And, and you know, you've seen three or four quarters of, you know, results and, you know, whether or not the things that you're focused on have started to show up in the numbers and things like that. Um, I mean, there are shorts that we are in right now that we've been in for two years. Like, we still think and and it's not because we're wrong and we're still waiting to be right i mean there can be that case but maybe it's like five percent ten percent in our favor and we think it could eventually be like 30 or 40 percent um but i think to for us to put out a short idea and say we think this plays out in three or four years or something yeah it's difficult given that we're an annual subscription sort of research <laughs> business. Um, so, you know, if, yeah. if someone's going to lose a lot of money in a year and it's time to renew, they're going to be like, I lost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so some of it is, I guess, business model driven. And, and then, I mean, a lot of the shorts, kind of the fraud type stuff, I mean, like wire card, I don't know if you followed that one, it was a huge like European kind of fintech thing. Um, and people had been calling it a short for years. And it, I mean, it, when you read the reports, like there was a lot of stuff to support it, but it crushed people. Like, I mean, it probably went up four or 500% before it ever started working. So that, I mean, even if it falls 50%, from the top, like there's still people that probably lost lost money 
shorting that. It's, we, life's too short for those sort of names for us. And we just, I guess it doesn't mix with the business. You don't model. want popular mainstream names. I mean, there are, there are like popular businesses or popular products or services that we will get involved with. Um, but, you know, I mean, one example is, is Peloton, like business crushed it during COVID and lots of people were calling it as a short and we thought it would be, but we just were uncomfortable getting in front of that freight train that just kept going. But then in, I guess it was like August and September, we saw some things that changed, like they discount the price of the bike by $400. The treadmill, you know, has problems because they had some accidents and deaths related to it. They launch a clothing line and they say, you know, this is going to be a huge business for us. Well, they've already been in clothing. They've just been putting their logo on other people's clothing, like oh. a Lulu lemon shirt or something. So we didn't, and that's a really difficult business and not like recurring revenue sort of stream like they're their products. And then there was stuff in the numbers, like in deferred revenue and time people were spending on the bike every month that just indicated that you had reached kind of the peak and it was rolling over. So at that point we were willing to get involved and short interest had gone from double digit to like three or 4%. So people weren't really thinking it was a short or had already lost so much money shorting it that they were done. So those sort of things can be interesting to us but timing is what's so important as a peloton user i'll tell you what i did this summer what people don't know is if you already own the bike you can turn off the actual subscription yeah. but for free you can still get all of the metrics so what i did was i went on amazon and i bought a clamp that you, <laughs> that you can put on a golf cart and you can host an ipad on there or an iphone right. clamped it to the screen and now I just plug my iPad in and watch YouTube. And if I want to watch my metrics, I can watch my metrics. Yeah. And to be honest with you, it was already what I was doing anyway while I was paying $40. So um, I'm going to add to your short thesis here. And I am short Peloton. Maybe not anymore. It's it's pretty much cratered. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, if you're listening to this, he's a, um instructor that actually lived here in Fort Worth at Zen 22 Spin Studio, got hired to go to Peloton. So my apologies, Dennis, if you're <laughs> listening to this. Um, okay. Um, let's just kind of bring the short discussion Then I want to have one kind of personal discussion of something that, that you're interested in. Um, but we're okay. We're in 2022. We've just come off of like two kind of really messed up years. Um, both just as a world, but if you look at like what's happened in the stock market and just some crazy things, um, euphoria is starting to wear off this isn't a, a market prediction question but when something like that happens and there's lots of euphoria and people are making a lot of irregular decisions because they feel like they have this huge tailwind at their back not an even fraudulent or unethical just kind of like when everything's going up into the right you said you kind of get that um sometimes misguided confidence as someone who is a healthy um, skeptic, like how do you think of this kind of winding down of euphoria? Does it still for you always matter the fundamentals of the business is what matters first? Or is there kind of this, um, is there gonna be additional kind of tailwinds in what you do that kind of push things down because euphoria starts to kind of come back to life? Yeah, we are always, first and foremost focused on the fundamentals. So it's a very bottoms up sort of process for us. It's not, oh no, um, energy prices are up. Can we go find someone that's making outsized money on that? It's more of like, this is a business that's, um, you know, the numbers are reflecting changes in the growth rate trajectory, changes in margins, changes in cash flow, you know, the balance sheet, leverage, things like that. And then would have um, 
I guess, qualitative reasons to support that, like a changing competitive landscape or some of those items I, I mentioned before. So I don't, I don't think that changes for us. You know, you do have to take what the market is, is giving you sometimes. So, um, like early in COVID, we spent time trying to find businesses that were perceived as COVID beneficiaries, but actually weren't. Now we've spent time in the past nine months trying to find, you know, trying to spend time on like COVID over earners. So they over earned during COVID and that should revert over time. And that's not being factored into estimates and valuation properly. But then we're just, we're always looking for businesses that let's say pre COVID they were losing market share and, and suffering. And we think that will return once things normalize, but then I guess interest rates also matter. I mean, the access to capital has been so easy. Now we're not saying the Fed's going to raise this many times, but it's like if they do raise, it starts to change the availability and cost of capital, which typically impacts valuations. And so it maybe the valuation part of our equation is not so open ended to the upside. Like, you know, there seems to be maybe some more um, rational thought about valuations when you're actually having to pay money to borrow capital to make acquisitions or, or things like that. But in, okay, let's just take that one situation. The Fed's kind of come out and said, we're going to raise rates, um, came straight out of their mouth. So from your perspective, if I'm a client buying your stuff, I might say, like, I don't need you to tell me that the Fed's going to raise rates. They already said they're going to raise rates. So from your perspective, just maybe just go a little bit further. How do you take what was said and think about that? Because you're not, your job isn't to guess if they're going to be right or not, or is it? Yeah. Yeah, we're not, um, like I said, trying to say the Fed's going to do six hikes or five hikes or one. It's just that, um, let's say if you looked over the past five years in software and the valuations that people paid for acquisitions were like 10 times sales or something, and that was in a free money sort of environment. Um, and you think rates are not going to be zero, then maybe that people are only paying six to eight times sales over the next five years or something. And so it it's not going to, um, I guess, change the way that we think fundamentally about a company, but maybe that we think about some of the risks like, okay, well, we don't think this, this company is trading at four times sales. If it could get bought out at 10 times sales, like that's that's not a good risk reward for us. But if it could if valuations come down enough where it can only get bought out at six times sales or something, then maybe that's a risk that we're willing Got it. to take. All right. Um this is a fun question. You don't have to answer it. Who is right, Ackman or Icon on Herbalife? Yeah, I guess Icon. Icon. Is that because that's what the results were? That's yeah. what you believe too? Yeah, I never, once again, because it was such a battleground sort of yeah, short, just didn't, I just didn't invest time or energy or, or emotion into it. Yeah. But. All right. I When when, um, when we do these, I always get to learn a little bit about the personal side. This one kind of stood out to me and we'll kind of bring it home on this note. And you kind of said, I'm a big proponent of helping others help themselves. And that's taken you to West Africa six times to train entrepreneurs and set up low interest microfinance systems. One, that's awesome. I love it. Can you describe a little bit more what what does helping others help themselves mean to you? And why do a lot of people, why aren't they able to achieve it on their own? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's that, I'm gonna butcher the saying, but like, you know, if you give a person yeah, a fish, can, yeah. you know, and, but you teach them to fish, like they can provide for their family and, and that sort of stuff. And and so at first, 
I guess it kind of happened more on a local basis um, with our family. So there was, there's a, a school in West Dallas called West Dallas Community School, and it was started by the same um, people that uh, started a private school in Dallas called Providence Christian School and <clears throat> classical Christian education. The difference is that you know the kids going to Providence or North Dallas, Park Cities, sort of people that can afford a private school tuition. The people in West Dallas, that's one of the poorest area codes in the city um, and, you know, high, high dropout rates, you know, like DISD, Pinkston High School, like, I think it's like 20% of people graduate or something like that. So the kids in that zip code were getting a chance to go get a education similar to what a, a kid in North Dallas might get and but only have to pay like 10 to 20 percent of it so they had to have some skin in the game it wasn't a handout but then they're getting this amazing like pre-k through eighth grade education and then those kids are getting like scholarships to Hockaday and St. Mark's and other private and public schools around around the city and so I guess we liked that model of helping them so that then they can help pull themselves out of generational poverty and teen pregnancy and all those sort of things. And then the company that I was working for uh, before I spun out with the research business, so it was still called Vision at the time. They did, so their Vision was actually started in the Harvard Business Plan, uh, Harvard Business School uh, business plan competition. So they went with this model for kind of independent research on kind of underfollowed companies they ended up launching it so they the founders decided let's have an internal business plan competition and one of the i guess ideas by one of the groups was to use uh microfinance or like small business training in africa to help people help themselves so the traditional microfinance model is a very high interest rate sort of thing. I mean, it's been very successful, very high payback rates for people that invest in it, things like that, but the interest rates can be pretty ominous. And this was to not make interest, to try and make money on it, just pay simple costs to the business, but to help these people, you know, either start or expand a business so that then they could, you know, provide for their family, um, give more to their church, be like, uh, I guess, helpful to the community or family members or things like that. And so I had, I guess, turned down or said no to lots of, um, I guess, opportunities to go overseas and build homes or things like that. I just, I'm not super handy. I'm not a doctor. I can't go on a medical sort of trip you know but here was an opportunity to go use like my accounting finance skills to help someone think through a business plan and and then i had employers that were willing to give you like an extra week of vacation to do that so like i couldn't say no i can't can't miss work <laughs> um so um my wife and i both both went the first time it was to ghana and it was just I mean, we were very fearful going, like going to very rural sort of West Africa, having never been to really a third world country. Um, but it was amazing experience, both, you know, getting to know another culture, getting to see people that were so content and happy with so much less than we have here in Dallas, Texas or in the United States, but then, you know, helping them think through a business plan. Um, and then I ended up going back and uh, I guess helping uh, helping them again and then getting to see some of those businesses actually like operating and people paying back their loans and um, providing for their families. And, and then I guess our church was more active in Senegal, which is another West African country and so we started 
instead of just going with this like mission organization, uh, we start going with our church to Senegal and doing the same thing. And so now our not all the trips have been kind of business as mission or small business training. Some of them have just been, you know, loving on kids and there's a at risk girls home that um, we've gotten involved with, but getting our kids out of <clears throat> out of Dallas and to another country, you know, I think has been something that's greatly benefited benefited them and us. And then obviously the people that we get to hang out with over there. How old were your kids when you started taking them over there? Uh, my youngest was six and the oldest was eight or nine. That's probably a good. Uh, six was looking back a, a good age to start. Yeah, you just need them to be past like napping and yeah. putting everything in their mouth and <laughs> um, that sort of stuff. If a six-year-old was, I have a five-year-old daughter, so if, if a six-year-old was, uh, your six-year-old was sitting here right now, and I'm sure it's been many, many years, but if she was still six and I asked her, what did you get out of that trip as a six-year-old, what, what do you think she would say? Yeah, I think she would say um, maybe what I said earlier. Like, I, I remember them coming back and saying they were just so happy and they didn't have anything. You know, that they, they might have the clothes on their back and another set of clothes in a bag or something, but that that was kind of it. And they're living in like mud, brick, you know, thatched roof homes, like you would you would think of in Africa. But they're just smiles and. They're not worried about being at the next meeting or, um, you know, one of them said to us, you know, you've got the watch, but I've got the time. Like they've got the time to sit there and be intentional and have a discussion with you. But, um, you know, as an American, I'm always thinking about, man, I got to get back to the hotel and check my email. What's, what's going on in, at the office or, you know, I've got a call or whatever. And, I think there's a what, simpleness to it that's pretty sweet. Is there anything they desire about American life besides like, and maybe this isn't even a thing they desire, like air conditioning and running water and just basic necessities, or do they even desire that? I mean, I think what you don't know, you know, you don't desire. Um, so like they don't know what it's like to have clean water all the time or not walk a mile to some well with a big water vessel on your head or shoulder or to have air conditioning because they just haven't had those so they don't really need it or or want it but i'm sure if they came over here and experienced those things then they might want them you might want them just like us you know we until we see someone else's car or house or or something we're content with with what we have that's a great way to end this uh puts a lot of things into perspective for everybody listening good thanks thanks for, th thanks for having me on this was awesome it was fun appreciate it